Welcome back. This is Arise News. You're watching The Morning Show with me, Bilal Abim. Webe Bora is the chief executive officer of All On and joined the team from Boston Consulting Group, where he was one of the founders of the strategy firm's Lagos office. Prior to BCG, Dr. Bora spent five years with Harris Holding Group here in Lagos, playing roles including chief of staff to the chairman, director of strategy, and the CEO of the Tony Lumelu Foundation. He has also worked at Rockefeller Foundation Africa, Africa's regional office in Nairobi, McKinsey and Company, and with World Vision, where he managed a USAID funded development project. While conducting his doctoral research in, in Nigeria for his Yale PhD thesis, Webe co-founded Afri One, the first ISP in North Central Nigeria. He has served on a variety of corporate and public sector boards across Africa, and he is the author of Story of Heroes and Epics, the History of Football in Nigeria. And that is actually why he's here today. Webe, thank you for being on the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's like a, such a long bio, but yeah. we have to tell people who you are. Yeah. So you've just written a book about the history of football in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And people at home are looking and they're saying, why is this guy writing a book about football and about Nigeria? So tell people a little bit about why this was important to you and just your, and who you, I mean, like not even your long ties, like sort of like the origin of yeah. your Nigerian connection. Yeah, so you actually left that part off my bio. I know. Um, I was actually born and raised <laughs> in Jos. Um, I spent uh, the first five years of my life after I was born in Jos in Tarab what is now Taraba State, mm -hmm. um, and then spent the rest of my upbringing in Jos um, at a time when it was truly one of the most amazing cities in the world. Wow. Um, and I think anyone who spent any time in Nigeria understands how passionate Nigerians are about football. Mm -hmm. um, and so this story is really about that, how that happened, mm. um, how Nigerians took to this game that was a completely foreign introduction. Mm. Um, so much so that there's no major Nigerian language that has an indigenous word for ball. Mm. So mm. it's not as if there was something pre-colonial that, that connected to this. It was completely new. Mm. Uh, was first introduced in Nigeria. The first game, recorded game, was in 1904. Um, you know, and within a few decades, it was so popular that it was actually contributing significantly to even developing Nigeria's identity as a country. Wow. Um, and by independence, it was central, actually, even to all the independent celebrations and everything like that. Wow. wow. So I want to ask you a question, not yet about the book, but mm -hmm. as someone that mm -hmm. grew up in, I mean, you've, you've grown up in Nigeria, you were born and raised in Jos. What is, how do, how do you feel about what's happening in Jos right now? And I mean, I think it's, I, I mean, just how do you yeah. feel about what's happening in Jos? You know, as I said earlier, I mean, when, when I grew up there, and I think it, anyone who spent time in Jos the 80s and 90s, I mean, it was truly a remarkable place. Um, it was the place where every Nigerian felt at home mm. and everyone from anywhere in the world felt mm. at home. Um, and it's really sad what has happened. I was actually there in September 2001 when the first big eruption mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, that was four days before 9-11. Um, and so the world forgot about it. Mm. Uh, but but it just, that crisis has basically continued on and off since then. You know, and it, for several years it's been quite peaceful, but then again, there's been eruptions again recently. And um, it's really sad. I mean, I still visit from time to time, but it's not the same city sure. I grew up in. Um, the potential is still there, the beauty is still there, and, and, and there's something special about Joss and the people there um, that we really need to work to restore. Mm. I mean, one of the things that I've, I, um, I, when I, when I worked at a multinational that was in media, I had to have a meeting with a certain number of people that come, came from just because there was just so much creativity and mm -hmm. originality and mm -hmm. authenticity in, the, mm -hmm. in their creativity, in their art. Right. And so, I, I mean, it's, it's a place that I would love to yeah. visit. And, um, You've never been there? I've, I can't, okay, I'm not gonna say it. Yes, I have not <laughs> been there, but I'll love to visit. Okay. Um, but back to the history yeah. of football. So first of all, as someone that is an historian, why is history so important? And especially, why do Nigerians need to pay attention to history more? Well, if you don't know, well, I think it's Bob Marley yes. that said it. If yes. you don't know your history, you don't know, you know, you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, it's incredibly important. A few years ago, actually, Nigeria even, I, I believe, took history out of the curriculum yes. for schools. I believe it's now been put back in. It has. Um, but even if you read any sort of basic text that's used in schools on Nigerian history, it's usually about how you know, we're completely different nations that were forced together and we kind of don't really like each other. 
and that's the story. Like, how do you build a nation mm. on that? Mm. Um, most nations in the world that have been successful have created what is called a, an imagined community. Yes. Where they sort of forget the bad things and just remember the good things, mm. and then they build that into something great, right? If you even look at, let's see, I mentioned 9-11 earlier, the mm -hmm. way the U.S. has written that story, mm -hmm. it was actually an embarrassing attack that it could happen, right? And no one caught it ahead of time. But afterwards, it's now become this sort of thing of we responded, we emerged greater, we this, we that. This unifying, yeah. it's become a unifying you know, and, and a rallying call. Exactly, a rallying call. I mean, in Nigeria, we don't do that. Everything is just another sort of, okay, another violence, another mm -hmm. this, another this that is sort of tearing us apart. Mm. And that's, you know, it, it, even uh, it's often talked about in history classes, the way, if you, if you see the way Americans write about the American War of Independence, the Revolutionary mm. War, it sounds as if it was the most important war of history. <laughs> in, in English, in Britain, <laughs> yes. kids will look at it as, oh, the war in the colonies or the conflict in the colonies, which is like gets maybe two sentences. Yes. It wasn't important. Yes. And so it's, you, you need to take charge of that and write your history, but write it in a way that gives a sense of ownership, national identity, confidence in the country, belief, mm. um, and we just don't do that here. I love how you talk about national identity and really this, this, this importance of telling our stories. Was it daunting to you when you started this project, considering the fact that we always hear that there's not enough data, there's mm. not enough information? Was mm. it daunting to you when you started this? Yeah, there's, there was an initial fear. You know, I thought, okay, this is an unusual topic to write a history of. Will there actually be material to, to find? Um, because usually in the historical records, it's the kind of official record of mm -hmm. political or tax or economics or whatever. And so this is something that happens sort of on the margins of, mm. of, of, mm -hmm. of officialdom, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I basically started my research. I was at Yale. I started the research um, going through the, the um, microfilm of old newspapers. And Yale's Africa Library actually has every single copy of every single Nigerian newspaper from 1860. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, till now, basically. And so I looked at every single page of every single Nigerian newspaper for the whole period of 1860 to 1960. Now, obviously, that sounds daunting, but for the first, like, almost 50, 60 years of that, there was one paper that was two pages long once a week. Oh, wow. So you got okay. through it quite quickly. Okay, okay. But obviously, through that, you know, you, you have the main news, and there's always going to be something about cricket or football or... Something when did that else. start creeping into the news into the um, newspaper? Kind of right from the beginning. I mean, oh, there was really? always that not football, but other sporting okay. activities. Maybe okay. it was polo. Maybe it was the horse races, something okay. like that. Okay. Um, so that was the first part. Then I went to Oxford um, in Rhodes House in Oxford. There's one of the um, it, there's basically an amazing archive of the personal papers of colonial officials. Um, oh, and so this okay. is the stuff that basically the letters they wrote home, maybe the diary that they took or the. The, 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 many of them wrote actually memoirs afterwards. Some were published, some were not. So that was so all like there. you can feel like you can go see like Lord Lagarde's like yeah. writings yeah, it's all and there. stuff. Yeah, there. It's all there. Wow. Um, and so in that you kind of you know you, I tracked down a lot of these guys who were in Borno or in you know wherever all yes. over Nigeria yes. at that time. And and you know obviously they would write about oh their great deeds as colonial officials and how they were building this. Great. Whatever. <laughs> and, 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 you know, but then there was always something like, oh, and then we played cricket, or then we played tennis, or we played polo, or we played football. You know, so you actually found that in there, um, especially in their personal letters. But then the most important part, obviously, was when I came to Nigeria and um, spent time going to the length and breadth of Nigeria, finding old enough players who could remember these times. And I mean, oh, wow. if you think about it, I actually did this main research. It was almost like 15 years ago. These guys already then had to be already in their 80s if they were going to have a meaningful contribution to the story I was wow. trying to tell. Um, and so even, you know, the, the first national team of 1949, um, many of those players had already passed away. But I, I was able to track down, for example, the captain, um, Etim Henshaw. He was, he was in, retired in Calabar. Um, and, you know, those were the days before Facebook and before yes. all that. And so you, you literally had to go there and, and ask and seek and find and hunt them down. Um, and, and it was just amazing to, to whenever I would find these guys, because nobody knows who they are anymore. Mm. And, and they would, they were so happy to tell the story. Um, but then in addition to that, I went to the, the archives here and we actually have amazing archives. Um, there's basically a national archive here in Lagos mm -hmm. and then in each of the former regional capitals. So in Enugu, in Ibadan and in Kaduna. Wow. And there is a wealth of information. So. Anybody who says we don't have enough documentary evidence to tell our story, it's not true. Okay. Um, any topic you want to write about in Nigerian history, go it to the archives. There. It is there. 
And I mean, again, this is a while ago, but it was very well organized. And the people at the archives were so helpful. And I mean, they were so excited. Someone was actually there to yeah. use the material. Um, and, and, and so, you know, let's make sure we use that. But I love the fact that you're debunking the fact that people are always afraid mm -hmm. to take on projects because they don't believe we have the historical mm -hmm. data and background. So I love the fact that you're debunking mm -hmm. that. So basically, people need to get out there, mm -hmm. go and look at the archives. Yes. Um, the other question I have for you is, are you a football fan? Obsessed with football. <laughs> yeah. Are you obsessed yeah. with football? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, so yes. you knew, I mean, so when you went, yeah. when you were at Yale and you're telling your dissertation yeah. supervisor, professor, that yeah. you want to write about Nigerian football, what yeah. was the reaction? Well, so when I started um, at, at my PhD at Yale, the first two years is coursework, bef before you kind of pick sure. your topic. And so through those, that two-year period, any Nigerian I would meet, whether in Nigeria or outside, anywhere in the world, I would ask them a question, what is positive, national, unifying, and historical for Nigeria? Mm. And the only answer, regardless of gender, ethnicity, religion, geography, whatever they were from, at the, you know, socioeconomic class, was football. It's the, the only one thing we all agree on. That everyone agreed, this is something we have that meets that category. So I thought, okay, well... That's, that's the topic I have to write on. I have to figure out how this foreign thing became so central to a national identity that that's the only answer everybody gives, wow. even people who don't like football. Wow. And so um, in, in 2018, so roughly, uh, sorry, 1998, so roughly 20 years ago, was when I had to make that decision, basically. And um, my, one of my doctoral advisors was Gambian, mm. um, big football fan. And so we were actually watching France 98 together. Nice. And I said, Professor Sani, what if I wrote the history of football in Nigeria as my dissertation topic? And he's like, well, we may, yes, let's try. Ah. You know, and so then he supported me and, and, and got the other, the other professors on board. It was a bit... No, it was a good way to, the that's time. the best way to do it. You know, have but, that casual environment, yeah. sneak it in yeah. and then sort of yeah. expand on and, it. And then since then, I mean, after that, they were incredibly supportive. And it, again, it turned out to be... Um, you know, it, I was able to tell a very interesting story. So, yes. I mean, this has been a long mm -hmm. process. Yeah. You have had many day jobs, according to, yeah. I mean, yeah. and to what, we, what yeah. we've said. How are you able to sort of balance both right. and sort of continue that process? Right. So when, you know, I finished my PhD basically in 2003, uh, and, and this was actually done in, uh, in yeah, so early 2003 as a dissertation, mm -hmm. but then it was a 500-page academic, volume, very academic, you know, and, and, you know, in academia, you kind of... It, almost have to make everything seem a little boring. Yes. So that people think you're really smart. Um, and, and that version of it, there's no way it would be popular, sure, something that people sure. would read. And because I didn't stay in academia and I went into you know, other, other sectors, um, I didn't have any kind of push to publish it. You know, if you're in academia, you have to publish that book to get your tenure. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and, and I didn't need to do that. So I kept saying, okay, I'll get it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. Um, and it, it really kind of just sat there for over a decade. Um, and then about three years ago, I, I met um, Bankole Oleabi from Bookcraft. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'd kind of been thinking, okay, I need to find a publisher. I just never had time. And I thought, look, you know, the best thing is actually to get a really top-notch Nigerian publisher, because in the end, this is a Nigerian story, mm -hmm. which I really want in the Nigerian market. You know, if I'd gone to a publisher in the U.S. or Europe, yeah, they would have published it, but it probably would have actually not gotten into the Nigerian market very mm, well. Mm. Um, so he was really supportive. He loved the idea. Um, you know, it still took a while. He, he um, got me an editor who basically went through that process of taking the 500 pages yes. down to what is readable and popular. And, you know, there's some parts we f I fought with the editor. That has to be kept that in the book. That has to stay in. No, you got to let it go because you know you uh, remember every yes, data point, the yes, blood, the sweat yes, that went into yes. getting that, and um, and so it came out. I had to kind of give him the freedom, and 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 you know the the end result is absolutely brilliant. So, so why did I mean if this is this football is this unifying? It's this nation building. It's the one thing we all agree on. How did it become ours? Like how did we start to own it? Yeah, so, I mean, that's the story of the book. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, um, okay, yeah. so tell us a little bit without giving too much yeah, away yeah, yeah. so we can go read it. Yeah, yeah, so, no, okay, like I said earlier, um, the first recorded match was in 1904. Which, Where? In Calabar. It started in Calabar, and it was actually a match between sailors from a British ship that, were, that had come to the port and then um, young men from the Hope Waddle Training Academy, mm. Training Institute, which was a, a Presbyterian school in Calabar, which obviously is still there. 
Um, and and so that that was the first recorded game we have. The Nigerian boys won, mm. which obviously implies that they must have been playing it for a while if they could beat British Those, sailors. Yes. Um, but I think it's important there to see that it was actually through missionary institutions that football was first introduced. Um, the colonial government schools would have introduced cricket. Um, and, and football then was taken from Calabar, became very popular there. Um, in 1906, Calabar then was, um, or Niger Lagos now became the capital of the Southern Protectorate instead of Calabar. Um, so a lot of the officials who had now come to play football in the, the, the Nigerian civil servants who were in Calabar now moved to Lagos, took the game with them. Um, you know, in the next two decades, it kind of took off in Lagos. Um, there was this British man working for a merchant company mm -hmm. called um, uh, Baba Echo, is, was his Baba name. Echo, yes. He was a, an, an Oyibo guy, mm -hmm. but that was the name he got because he was so popular. And he basically helped build and popularize football. Um, in, in the early 1920s, actually, one of the big stars of Lagos football was Namdi Azikwe. Um, who then went on to be the captain of the football team at Lincoln University in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and he actually then played a huge role through what we call the indigenization of the game mm. um, to make it popular in Nigeria. Mm. Um, but by the 1930s, it had kind of expanded enough that it was becoming more popular than games like cricket. But that, that expansion really happened through, like I said, missionary schools, um, through railway workers, through who, who took it you know, across the country, um, through non-commissioned officers in the in the in the in the British service military mm. service plus the Nigerian soldiers So what it was is it was not the senior mm -hmm. Kind of elite that it, that spread football. It was the next layer down mm. and, and sort that, of like that middle to lower yeah, middle and I think and, and and that seems that's why it became so widely popular because it was never seen as really associated with the colonial state mm. while cricket always was mm. um, yeah and so is that why it's so important to make the distinction between the fact that the colonials had this mm. different type of sort of sports that they mm. were introducing into mm. the Nigerian community mm. and also the missionaries brought it with them a different type of so sports? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was more the, you know, the missionaries and the tradesmen and the railway mm. workers were more the sort of, you know, middle class. Mm. Um, and so, so for them that, you know, in England also football was middle class and it wasn't that the elites wouldn't be caught dead kicking a ball. Um, and so that kind of transferred to Nigeria, but it helped make football kind of populist from the beginning. Um, the other thing is, you know, when, when f football, so the, the Lagos District Amateur Football Association, which was like the first organized football um, administration, was interracial from the beginning. Mm. Um, when the Nigerian Football Association was first founded in 1933, interracial from the beginning. Cricket was very different. Polo was different. Um, Cricket was, they actually had a, a, a European Nigerian Sorry. cricket board yeah. and a African Nigerian cricket board. Oh, okay. In those days, actually, Nigerian just meant anyone living in Nigeria. Yeah. So there were European Nigerians and then there were African Nigerians. Um, and that, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't until the 1950s that it came to mean what we see it as now. Ah. Um, and, and, so, um, and so that kind of made cricket always seem different. And then if you even look across Nigeria, all of these sort of old colonial clubs like mm -hmm. Ikoyi Club. Yeah. Most of these clubs, there was usually a club in every every major colonial mm -hmm. center that had, like the European club, Sports. had cricket, had a cricket oval. The African club had a football field. Hmm. And you actually can go to these places and you still see all this today. Oh wow! And it's something we don't even know. Oh wow! You know, is is, is in that history. When you look at how football became widespread in Nigeria, and mm -hmm. you look at other places with very similar histories in mm -hmm. colonialism, like India or mm -hmm. Pakistan. Why is it that those countries gravitated more towards cricket mm. rather than football, yeah. even though we have a shared history? Yeah, no, I mean, there, there's, a, there's sort of a view globally that where the, the, very, where the British colonial service was very heavy at the top and a lot of the kind of elite Oxford, Cambridge graduates who were running it and there was a lot of colonial officials in those countries, cricket and polo, especially cricket and, and then even rugby became very popular and football really didn't take off. Mm. But in those places where either colonial, um, either colonies or other places where the British had influence, where it was more the merchants and the missionaries and the kind of the, the, the more the middle class were, were kind of the, the bigger number, then football took off. So I mean, even if you look at South America, you know, most of those countries, while they weren't British colonies, mm. you know, Argentina, Missionary. Brazil, all of those, it was actually British traders and merchants who actually took football to those ah, countries and set up clubs okay. and all that. 
Okay. Um, so the interesting thing is, even though we have this huge rivalry with Argentina yeah. in football, and you think of them as a totally Spanish, it was really the same group of people that brought football there that brought it here. Oh, wow. Um, but then in Nigeria, you know, the colonial, by the time Nigeria was colonized, it was actually relatively late in the colonial period, if you look at it globally. Mm, mm. And so, you know, Nigeria was colonized with a very thin layer of British colonial oversight. Um, there was a time, in, for example, in all of northern Nigeria, there were 12 colonial officials. Um, and so because that layer was so thin, they didn't have the ability to influence enough to spread their kind of ideals through cricket and all that. Mm. And so because the, the majority of those who were in Nigeria, again, were that second layer, the, oh, yeah. the more the middle class, that's why football kind of took off. Again, there's that other reason of the, the sort of the racial dynamics. But then there's also, I think, if you look at um, football, it's a lot more, it's about virtuosity. Mm. It's about free, you know, it's, mm -hmm. and so I think, but for the, I think it fits better also with Nigerian And there's culture. a simplicity to it. I yeah. mean, I Cost. mean, in the book, I yeah. mean, I was reading yeah. something and it was just like people knocking around like a mango seed. Like, yeah. I mean, any yeah. sort of round yeah. object can yeah. be used. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. And cricket obviously costs more because you have to have a bat. <laughs> yes. You have to have, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, there was a time where there was actually a plan to put um, Nigeria, Gold Coast, Sierra Leone and Gambia together as like a West Africa cricket team, sort mm -hmm. of like the West Indies. Yes, yes, yes. But it just never took off. Never took off. Yeah. So what yeah. I love about the way the book starts is sort of like from the first word, you're mm -hmm. sort of in it. Mm -hmm. And in the introduction, it says, when teenage football sensation Julius Aga Agahawa scored two successive goals to save Nigeria's senior national team, the Super Eagles from a quarterfinal exit at the hands of Senegal and the 2000 African nations exuberant fans invaded the national stadium pitch and held up the match. The nail biting. So my favorite part of this is the nail biting drama excitement of Nigeria come from behind. Victory was too much for pre pregnant spectator <laughs> Aisha Toyerinde, who went into preterm labor, but thankfully gave birth to a healthy boy who was appropriately named Julius. An elderly man watching the match on television in Kano was not so lucky. He suffered a heart attack while leaping for joy and was completely ignored by fans around him who, who were more interested in the game than his predicament. Nigerian fans in Ilari, angry that the electricity had failed while they were watching the match, burnt down the house of Fe Felix Oketunji, an employee of the National Power Company. I mean, to me, these three stories really yeah. show the passion, the energy, just the sheer joy that mm -hmm. football brings to Nigerians. Mm -hmm. How did, I mean, how did you find out about these things? Were they like, in, I didn't, I don't remember seeing them in the national, in all, national news. All of this is in the, yeah, it was all in the national All in the national yeah, newspaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like yeah. really like almost. You just have to dig below the it's surface. It's like almost like discovery, yeah, rediscovering yeah. and really reliving these yeah. stories. And yeah. what amazing stories to tell. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is when you look at some of the newspaper headlines. So here, the Daily Times, it says professional football in Nigeria will be a farce. And this is R.B. Allen, the honorary secretary of the NFA, argues against professionalizing football in Nigeria. Right. Can you give us a little bit yeah. of background yeah. around that? So the, um, it, by the, the 40s and 50s, you know, especially in Lagos, there was a pretty developed league. Um, but the teams were mostly basically government agencies that had teams. So like... Mm. The railway had, a, had a, basically the best team. Um, Marine had a team. Um, you know, Post and Telegraph had a team. Works okay. and Housing had a team. And then also there were teams from the trading companies. Um, Namdi Ezekwe also had a series of teams from his Zeke Athletics Clubs, which were in Lagos and all over Nigeria. But basically the, the, the teams were made up of players who were not professional footballers. They were... You know, they had day jobs in, in, the, in, the, in the organization. In the service, yeah. So, like, the, the railway would be guys who were civil servants in the railway who then in the evening would take off their suit and tie and shoes and go and play football. Um, now, you, railway kind of crossed the line of whether it was really professional because the, the, there was a guy who was a senior official in the railway named uh, Yurian who would actually recruit young Nigerians who were known to be f really good at football straight out of secondary school, mm. bring them to Lagos, and find a job for them in the railway administration. <laughs> and they were really just there to play football. Okay. Um, and, and there was one, one of those old players, his name was is Justin Onwudiwe. Um, I, I, I met him in Oweri and he told me this whole story that he literally, leaving, the, leaving his graduation, Urian met him and basically took him in a car and took him to Lagos for his new job. Oh, wow. And then he became you know, a, one of the key defenders of the, of the railway team and eventually played for Nigeria. Um, and and so, so in that case, they kind of drew the line. But I think that's what he was, 
he was talking about that, you know, we need to leave it as amateur mm. um, because as soon as you bring too much money into the game, it will become a different thing. It was sort of that sort of British ideals about sports that, that were pretty dominant at the time. Um, what did happen, though, several of the Nigerian players who, who were on the 1949 team that went to England, mm -hmm. um, a number of them either immediately then or later um, did come back and signed professional contracts, um, contracts with, with English teams. Um, but most of those, if they did that, would then not ever be able to come back and play in Nigeria. Oh, um, wow. And so, you know, there was Peter Anosike who signed, signed for Swindon Town. Yeah. Um, and he was like the superstar of Nigerian football and then actually struggled to make an impact even on their third, their third division team. Mm. So it kind of woke people up of mm. where the quality really was. Um, but then Teslim Balogun, who yes. the stadium yes. is named after, he's probably the most well-known yes. of that era. Yes. Um, he signed for QPR. Queen's Park Rangers, mm -hmm. um, and actually did very well. Um, he's the first Nigerian to score against Arsenal, which is my uh, club. Uh, um, you know, but but he he actually then went and made made waves. Um, but there were very few of them. Some of them did that. But then when when Balogun came back, he he came back not as a player but as a coach. Uh, so I don't want to I don't want to lose this because there is um, there is a lot about women's football in this book as well. And I just want to read this other headline, which is NFA will not encourage women's football, which is colonial. This is colonial, colonial era news article on women's football in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Why was there so many? Why was there so much tension around women's football in Nigeria? Right. Again, I mean, so much of this was influenced by sort of British culture and then how that permeated into colonial policy. And so they, they actually, because the NFA was actually under the, the English FA. Mm. And so if the English FA had a policy, the NFA had to have that policy. And so they, they made a very clear policy that women's football should not be encouraged. Any um, football field that was sanctioned by the NFA, you know, that as, a, as, a, as a field that could be used for official games or referees or anything like that, they were not allowed to Part, they were not, the fields weren't allowed to be used for women's football and the referees weren't allowed to officiate matches. Wow. Um, so quickly, how, yeah. was that, how, did that, how was that barrier broken? Yeah, so, so at that time, in those days, I mean, there would still be matches, but it was all very kind of, it would be like, you know, 11, 11 women playing 11 middle-aged men and then the women would all change at halftime. So it was all kind of um, seen as sort of a, a novelty. Oh, um, but there okay. was a match in, as early as 1950 where it was a women's game and there were 10,000 Spectators. Spectators. Wow. Um, but eventually, women's football was actually not officially sanctioned as a official sport in Nigeria until 1989. Oh, wow. And then the interesting thing is, two years later, the women's team were at the World Cup. It took the men's team like 90 years to get there. So in the end of the day, women's football has actually brought us more success. Mm. Um, the Nigerian women's team, the Super Falcons, are the only African team, male or female senior team, to have beaten England. Wow. Um, you know, so they have actually had a lot more success even than the Super Eagles, but... I wish that we yeah. can give them... I wish they got more airtime yeah. and just more um, yeah. write-ups. So the book is The Story of Heroes and Epics, The History of Football in Nigeria. Where can people get this? I think they yes. can get it all over the country now. Yes, well, it's not everywhere in the country yet, but, but Bookcraft is working hard to get it all over. Um, you can actually deliver it anywhere in Nigeria. Okay. Um, it's available in, um, in the Palms Mall, in the bookstore there. It's available in, uh, in um, Terraculture. Okay. Um, okay. It's at Quintessence. It's, at, um, it's also at the airport. And it's in Joss. And it's in Joss, yes. yes. And it's in Abiokute, yeah. Baden, Suleri. Yeah. But we're getting it to the rest of the country. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this book. I think this is a gift to Nigeria, and um, I'm sure your, your, your passport and your, your, your citizenship is safe with this book. It's been secured and sealed, and um, thank you again for being here this morning. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. That brings us to the end of the morning show today. I'm Biola Labi. Thanks to Abisoya Ajay and Webe Bor for joining me, and of course, to you at home for watching. Goodbye.